everybody. Um, my name is Mark Reed, and I work at the British Film Institute. And I'm delighted to be a the Film Education Program to be here uh, on Society M. I'm a set of conversations around Film Education. It's been fascinating fabulous so far. I noticed we've got we've had a bit of an audience refresh, which is great. So there's some people who say hello and welcome to. Um, we also got the back after your coffee. Um, this morning we start. Well, one of the first presentations, Malena, has that, that quote, that quote um, from Sweden from 1908 that asks, Why are we taking children out of the big, bright, beautiful world, putting them in the dark and subjecting them to a world of sin, shame, and sorrow? Yes. Of, um, and stress. Was, there, there, there were lots of S's in there. Um, so, in this final session, um, what I'm hoping is that we, we find out that you don't actually. Education, have to subject children to sin, shame, and sorrow in the dark. <laughs> um, you can actually use films to explore uh, how wonderful the world is and the kind of you know, the, the variety of multiplicity, the, the veracity um, of the world outside. Um, and what's also wonderful is that we've been all over the world today, um, from New South Wales through various points mm -hmm. in Africa to Sweden, and we've ended up back in Glasgow with four presentations of four projects that are based in the city and two, two schools which are. Pretty much around the corner. So we've been, we've been global, we've been, we've been global, which is, shows the full range of film education activity um, that we're engaged with. So we, we've got four presentations. We're going to start with Michael Daly from John Paul Academy, um, who's going to talk about his work with Interfilm, uh, award winning work with Interfilm, uh, and these projects can go on. Um, second is uh, Shona Thompson um, from Kind of Sea, who's going to talk about her work with Archive Film. Which was sponsored by that of um, film festival uh, called the Our Mary Hill Project, which is just over there, um, and the work that she's been doing with St. Charles Primary. Um, then Yasmin Al and Al Gifi and Christine McCarroll from Glendale Primary School will share some work that they've been doing on the Other Signing Cinema Project program, um, another kind of international, uh, international film education program um, that the Glasgow has taken a fantastic um, participation for, for the last few years or so. Um, and then finally, um, as, as the school is that right, into the kind of youth community sector, uh, it's still school based. Um, very large, obviously, in Bristol. Um, and the government, young or government youth, government young, and um, I actually live very part time um, which is looking at uh, the history and, and culture um, of, of government of, of the local place and how to involve and engage with people in the history of the place they live. Um, so we've got 15 minutes for each, uh, and each, I think, we've got bit, bits of moving images, so it's nice to see um, bits of work that uh, we have made, if, if possible. Um, and then we'll have, we'll all squeeze on stage for the last, for the last 10 minutes or so. Um, <coughs> so, straight over. Thank you. I always like to start with that slide. It's nice to be reminded of the time that maybe read me and asked who his photo taken with me. And I think you can see with a look in both our faces, he was completely in awe. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank Jamie and Mark for having me along to speak at such a wonderful event. My name is Michael Daly and I'm an English teacher at John Paul Academy in Glasgow. Although I'm the only one standing here, what I do is very much a shared effort with my colleague Jacqueline Thompson. But unfortunately she can't be here today because she's got a legion of people trying to get her ready for prom tonight. That is quite the operation. I think before we share our experiences of film education, it's worthwhile to give a social context to our school. Well, the very definition of an inner city school, the British government presents quite a harrowing stat that one in five children in Glasgow live in poverty. We have a current school role of almost a thousand pupils. This is not an anomaly for a school. However, out of these pupils, over 75% of our cohort are categorised as SIMD1. This standard in the social index and multiple deprivation means they're living in areas that are the most socially and economically deprived in the United Kingdom. If we apply this understanding to our school, then three out of four pupils in my classroom fall into this demographic. In 2015, the First Minister of Scotland launched the Scottish Attainment Challenge. The very foundation for equity in education hinged in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. I 
and these are just a couple of statements from it. We've achieved remarkable results using film as an educational tool to facilitate increased pupil engagement and bridge the educational impact of poverty. This lofty goal wouldn't have been possible without the educational charity Into Film. Into Film has provided a platform that's got education at its core. Combining it with film has truly captured the imagination of our pupils. We've been very fortunate to be part of Into Film since it began in Scotland. There were a variety of reasons behind our decision to start at first an extracurricular Into Film Club. The most prominent was that we felt our pupils were being priced out of going to the cinema. I think it's £11.10 now at Cineworld if you're over the age of 14. And with such astronomical prices, it would make it very, very difficult for kids from our catchment areas to enjoy film the way it was intended to be viewed. The cinema is the environment that we should enjoy all film to savour the spectacular plots and the powerful acting performances that can define your generation. Three years in a row, our school was nominated for Film Club of the Year out of 14,000 schools across Britain. This enabled a selection of our members to attend a glitzy award ceremony at the Inti Film Awards in London's Empire. Here they rubbed shoulders with the likes of Simon Pegg, Daniel Craig and Naomi Harris. In 2017, they were finally rewarded for their efforts and won Film Club of the Year. They received their award from Oscar winner Eddie Redmayne. This is beyond any of our pupils' wildest dreams, the majority of whom turned up at Glasgow Central with passports, wondering if they needed them to go to England. Over the three years, 40 pupils, <laughs> over, the, over the three years, we took 40 pupils to London with us, and luckily enough for my career, all 40 made it back to Glasgow. <laughs> the great thing about film is that it doesn't discriminate. The positive impact of film as an educational tool is incredible and its potential is limitless. Into Film has tapped into this. They provide encouragement for pupils to write reviews. This promotes literacy in a positive and fun way. Each young person has a unique perspective on any given school subject, and film should be no different. With their website, Into Film provides a place for pupils to engage with film, and it promotes literacy out with the classroom. With pupils logging into their Into Film accounts from the home, they can explore films of their choice and then review them. With pupils selecting their own viewing materials, then it creates the personalisation and choice that Curriculum for Excellence craves. It is this sense of autonomy that we should be encouraging our young people. Pupils' reviews are seen as something that's not an academic task that has a grade attached to it. This ensures that the pupils are really comfortable with what they're undertaking and they have the freedom to review with honesty. Reviews are judged solely in their content, and this enables pupils, regardless of their ability in the classroom, to write without fear of being corrected. While I'm big on grammar and punctuation, some of our members feel it's optional. And who am I to argue? As long as they enjoy what they're undertaking, they're writing and they're engaging, I think that's what's most important. The accounts that the pupils have are extremely useful to us as teachers, as they provide us with evidence that would permit us to chart their development both in literacy and analytical skills. The debates around film in which the pupils engage in also help to promote their higher order thinking skills. For example, if we use Christie from our film club, we can clearly chart our development from our first review. Again, not a bad review, it's quite plot heavy, spine chilling plot, wicked comical jokes, not bad. And then we see the progression. She's now starting to do a bit of research. She's looking at the director. She's looking at the cast. There's definite progression there. And then if we move into our second year, she's doing a bit more. She's going into a bit more detail. She's now thinking about how much it's taken at the box office. There's definitely improvement. And then I won't make you read it, but that was her final review of the year. And if we take it from point A to point B, and film is given her the little academic breadcrumbs that gets her to this point, and it's extracurricular, then I think that's something pretty magical. It's timelines like this that we use the pupils to show their progress, much in the same way I would have a generic learning conversation with a pupil. This recognition for the reviews, skill improvement, only encourages further progression as they gain in confidence. The skills that they develop 
in extracurricular film clubs are definitely transferable to the classroom. The very definition of literacy is changing, and as educators, we have to truly embrace this and champion film literacy. Glasgow City Council has an authority-wide focus on the improvement of literacy, and film is an engaging way of promoting this within our school. We've formed a clear link between film and education, with our focus being currently on the links between film and literature. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has also launched her Reading Challenge. Now, if attainment is linked to enjoyment, surely this emphasises the merits of film as an educational resource. Whether we like to admit it, the texts that we want the children to engage in are changing. The traditional book is becoming almost obsolete outside of the classroom, and as an English teacher, this is something that pains me greatly. I referenced Charles Dickens in one of my classes, and I got absolutely nothing. In the same lesson, I mentioned Steven Spielberg and I was met with an avalanche of information about his films. I saw a massive tangent occur, and being an English teacher, I love a tangent from the lesson plan. It's imperative that we use film to meet the demands of the modern learner. Film provides an important inroad into the promotion of literature. Instead of thinking the two are fighting against each other, then why not use film to facilitate literature? We are teaching our pupils that falling in love with a film is just falling in love with a story. We use films that they love to generate interest in books they've never heard of. By starting with a film that's current and appeals to our pupils, being teenagers, we're then able to make the literary links. Once the pupil's interest is peaked, then we can make progressive pathways to increase both viewing and reading stimulus. Opportunities pupils are not really aware of unless we point it out to them as educators. And then once we do this, then we can increase the level of challenge as the pupils transition through the texts. Children have it so easy nowadays. They are bombarded with choice. Streaming sites such as Netflix and Amazon Prime have ensured that children have an endless supply of film only a click away. They will never get to experience a Friday night in Blockbuster or Global Video. They will never understand the pain of hiring a video and taking it home to realise that the person who had it before you hadn't rewound it. This is the struggle that I faced as a child. Pupils engage with film on such a personal level and they're keen to discuss what they like and what they don't like. Staff and pupil relationships are inextricably linked to educational success. Film is the one thing that even on a basic level we all have in common. In our film club we try and maintain and encourage continuous engagement so we run certain months that are linked by theme and the most popular has been teacher's choice, not that we forced it on them but it just has. To make this happen, we would ask colleagues to put forward their favourite films. Teachers would then come into the hall at the start and explain to the pupils why it was their favourite film. It was so enjoyable and engaging for the pupils because they were given a window into what their teachers were like as people through their choice in films. Pupils were genuinely surprised when a serious deputy came in and told them that his favourite film was Disney's Lady and the Tramp because he used to watch it with his daughter religiously when she was growing up. This connection with teachers is important to the success of film education. Pupils have to feel comfortable and secure enough to have their own opinions, even if it challenges that of the teachers. For example, during one of our teachers' choice meetings, I decided to get the pupils to watch a favourite of mine. I chose We Bought a Zoo, starring Matt Damon. Has anybody seen it? I'm about to absolutely ruin it for you. <laughs> uh, it's about a man who decides to relocate his young family after his wife passes away. And as the cryptic title suggests, they buy a rundown zoo. The story is heartwarming as the family struggle to carry the burden of losing their mother and then they face several challenges restoring the zoo to its former glory. With such a nice story behind it, I felt that this would be a surefire winner with our pupils. <laughs> Oh my god, you bought a zoo, no one cares. Absolutely raging emoji. 
sadly, Callum didn't share my enthusiasm, but whether you love a film or you hate it, it's already fulfilled its educational purpose, and that's to provide opinion and discussion points. One of the most important curricular developments that we are currently exploring at John Paul Academy is using film to provide an alternative curriculum for some of our most vulnerable pupils. We've used films such as Ridley Scott's The Martian to encourage pupils to undertake maths, physics, chemistry to save the stranded astronaut. These were the same pupils who were utterly disengaged in the maths and science classrooms. What was the reason for their sudden change in enthusiasm? It's because we use film as a context for learning. I firmly believe that it's an important educational observation that we've made, that there's the potential to build a curriculum around children with additional support needs by using film as the anchor that holds the learning in place for them. Stepping away from the educational impact, one of the strengths of running extracurricular film clubs in your school is that they are entirely inclusive. The majority of schools place a predominant focus in sports such as football and netball. What happens to the pupils that don't have the athletic prowess to take part or that they just don't like those sports? Film is excellent for building friendships and forming relationships as it creates a common ground. I feel that engagement with film shouldn't be limited to just the classroom. It should unite the entire school community because that's what everybody always harps on to as an education. It's a community. It's a community. One of the biggest achievements for us this year has been the integration of John Paul Academy Film School. This interdisciplinary experience provides a seamless transition through a wealth of subjects where fun and learning are tied to different careers within the film industry. For example, in media, the pupils undertake animation. In technical, they learn about the intricacies of scale modeling. In art, they practice set building. Vital hard skills are developed to work within the industry. This ensures that pupils are given every opportunity to succeed and they leave school prepared for positive destinations, whether in employment or further education. The film industry is one of the UK's most emerging job markets, and I think it should be something that schools and further education establishments would be really foolish to ignore. It's a very exciting time to be involved in education. I'm passionate about film, and I'm certainly not the only one. The enthusiasm and excitement that film generates is infectious. And that's why Into Film and John Paul Academy are so successful. Into Film taps into everything that is magical about the film industry, but more importantly, they make it accessible for pupils from any background. Working with Into Film has seen that our pupils grow from strength to strength, and we've tried to give them every opportunity available. We've made clear links in learning both skill and skill application, both in education and in the workplace. It's been a truly inspiring day, and to all the educators and filmmakers in the room, you have no idea the positive impact that you're making at classroom level for the promotion of film as an academic resource. Thank you very much for all the hard work you do. Thank you very much. So, hello, yes, my name is Shona Thompson uh, and I'm here to talk about the project Arrowberry Hill. Uh, this is one of your classic holding slides for the event that we did at uh, Glasgow Film Festival. I should stand near the microphone, shouldn't I? That's a bit easier, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, I thought um, I'd say a little bit about myself and then talk uh, a bit about the project um, and how that came about, what the aims of it was, and then I'm going to show some films that we curated together um, as part of the project and then talk a little bit about some of the learnings that came from it. So, um, I'm an independent uh, curator and producer. Um, and I operate under the banner of a kind of seeing um, and I show films. I initiate and collaborate on projects um, and film exhibition um, across the country. It's live events, it can be commissions, um, I work with silent film with live score. Um, it's a project I did with uh, beatboxer Jason Singh. Um, and I work in communities all over Scotland and the UK um, showing archive films, programmes that might be more specific to the place that I'm in, that are specific to the audiences that I'm going to see as well. Um, and I've also worked as an applied learning tutor. I'm currently working with the MSc in film exhibition and curation um, at the University of Edinburgh's course. Um, so I, I work with them, the students there on the actual production and delivery as much as the curation of your events. 
So I use archive film and the big screen, big screen's very important to me, um, as a stimulus for bringing people together and for facilitating conversations around place, around identity, um, and also around the past from the archive films, but also to talk about the future and how much those films can have a power and an impact. So, um, so our Mary Hill um, came uh, from Glasgow Film, from the team there who run the Glasgow Film Theatre, who run the Glasgow Youth Film Festival, the Glasgow Film Festival, and um, it was the guys there that actually approached myself to be part of the team to work on it. I'd already been working, um, done a couple of their shows for Movie Memories, which is their season of dementia-friendly screenings, which happen every month. Um, and I'd done a couple of archive film shows around Glasgow, about Scotland, about sports, and um, so it was actually Rebecca and Jody who approached me. Um, each have got quite separate roles in the organisation. As you can see, Rebecca is more focused on, on children and young people, and Jody is the public engagement coordinator as much as access as well. So, um, sort of different different age group there. And um, really, what um, Glasgow Film wants to do was is, was a partnership project, working with the National Library of Scotland Moving Image Archive, our national film archive here. Um, with myself as a kind of seeing and also the Seymour Community Cinema which is based in Mary Hill. It's uh, an old cinema which closed down and then uh, reopened again um, as a community centre and equipment has been bought and it's now getting uh, every so often there's some uh, regular film screenings. It's, it's a wonderful space uh, to be in and it's a real hub of Mary Hill. It's not far from this, this where we're actually sitting right now as well. Um, and it was about putting together an afternoon of archival screenings as part of Glasgow Film Festival in the Seymour Cinema, in the centre of, of Mary Hill, um, that were curated by the local community um, from a series of workshops. So it was about collaborating with different experiences and different perspectives on film, uh, with people of all ages. Um, so trying to find that elusive, deeper, sustained engagement that an organisation like Glasgow Film um, and myself as well, as a kind of seeing, um, are, are working towards. And Mary Hills, we've heard from, from Michael there, um, which is part of the, the area that, that is in the catchment for John Paul Academy, um, is, the, is apparently the highest demographic mix of young and older persons. Um, and it's an area with high levels of low to no income. So um, we worked with four groups in total in the area. Um, we worked with Primary 6 group um, from St Charles Primary School. We worked with the Inter Film Club with Michael um, and the team there at John Paul Academy. And then we also worked with Hope Hill residents. Hope Hill's a housing complex in Mary Hill, uh, which is run by Queen's Cross Housing Association, so an older, a group of older folk who don't normally meet as a group, uh, but they all live in the same space. Um, and then the Community Connectors group in the northwest of Glasgow as well. Similarly, Community Connectors is a scheme by the Glasgow Council for Voluntary Service and it's about uh, finding folk and connecting folk who maybe don't necessarily engage uh, uh, with the outside world, to be honest. There's a lot of work around tackling social isolation with, with the Community Connectors group. So um, we had uh, some aims that were, that were set um, for the whole project. Um, and you can see them there, there's five of them there. So learning firsthand about the National Library of Scotland Moving Image Archive, and I cannot say enough how I would recommend going to have a look at the archive. It's based at Kelvin Hall, um, and uh, they also have a great website, movingimage.nls.uk. You'll lose hours on it, it's brilliant. Um, I spend a lot of time digging around in there. So learning firsthand about that, and the op their open access, and they've got thousands of, of archive films there. Um, developing a greater understanding of the power of archive film, understanding how archive film as a literacy tells a story, um, reflecting on what Mary Hill means to them. So it's very, we wanted it to be um, something that was, that was place-based, it was going to be screening in a, in a venue in their community, um, and, and we wanted the selection process, the curation process, to be a community-led um, uh, process. Um, and also gain greater confidence and skill in public speaking as the participants are, are encouraged to share their motivations for choosing their footage on the day, which quite frankly as a curator I find quite difficult sometimes. Sometimes it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feeling that you have. Um, so it was, it's quite an interesting uh, element to add into the, the whole process. So we had a series of curation workshops that I worked with Becca um, and Jodie and there was also a visit to Kelvin Hall 
which is not necessarily a place that um, all of the participants would normally go to or be aware of. Um, and, uh, and then that culminated in a public screening at Glasgow Film Festival just at the beginning of March this year. Um, and there was four film compilations. So each group put together their own compilation of archive film that was important to them um, from those workshops. Um, and then they were introduced by each of those groups as well, themselves. Um, and, uh, and they worked with Becca and myself and Jody on that. <coughs> so I'm going to focus today on uh, working with the St. Charles Primary School um, group. And, um, and I thought what I'd start off with, well, just what I'd show is the first five minutes of St. Charles's um, compilation of films that they showed at the public event, that they're dead proud of, by the way. They, they loved it, um, what, the, what they put together. The group decided to split their uh, section into themes. That's what kind of came out of the conversations. Um, we had uh, sports, we got that there. Yeah, there's the event that actually happened in the, at Glasgow Film Festival. So it was busy. Uh, we put, set up the, um, the, the, the temporary screen there. Uh, that's what the cinema looks like. And uh, so there was, uh, they had themes. They had sports, transport, food, and brothers and sisters. Quite general um, subjects, but uh, <coughs> But it's kind of what came out of the conversations and they kind of sort of quite specific. And we um, encouraged them to be uh, looking at the research as well. So research each of these, these subjects. And these were the things that came out so for sports, which is what I'm going to show you now. Uh, it makes me feel good. It happens to everyone. <laughs> not sure if that's to everyone. I'm not sure that's a very positive one. But uh, fights happen, but happiness too. I think that means in, in the competitive spirit. Um, and Mary Hill Sports brings families together. So it's where Fir Hill, it's where um, Queen's Park, uh, not Queen's Park, uh, Football Club, what's the football club in Mary Hill? Park Thistle, thank you very much. It's where Partick Thistle is, is based as well. So it's also uh, sports has that association. So, um, so this is the, the sports uh, section I'm going to show you. Just, it's about four or five minutes. You've got films from the 1920s, 1950s and 1960s as well. And the process which I'll go through, but I showed films to begin with, basically. Um, and, uh, and these ones really caught their imaginations, really stayed with them throughout the process. Um, and I think there's something there about the connections to their lives now, and it was something they talked about as well. Most importantly, it made them laugh. Um, and uh, I will let you decide which bits made them laugh as well. There's health and safety situations going on, which they're very well aware of. Um, and, uh, and a few special characters, one in a sack, that's all I'm going to say, okay? So, just... So yeah, I, I did a first edit of that film um, a bit differently than the first time round and showed it to them. They said, where's Vestman? We need Vestman in there. Why is Vestman not there? So they got at the end there, they loved Vestman running across. And it did take them a wee while to say, yeah, I suppose, yeah, we're going to be against health and safety to have them hitting each other with pillow cases at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was the, the kind of, and also the music as well was very much their choice too. In fact, one of the, the guys in the group said, uh, what about Django Reinhardt? It's like, okay, great, found some. So that was, it was uh, really fascinating, interesting what Michael's saying there about literacy and how that sort of brings out that kind of uh, conversation. So I just thought it'd be quite useful um, to sort of go through what the process was. So there's lots of words in this one, but um, that we started in session one uh, with um, what is a moving image archive. And you'll see it's quite a short time scale. We started the week beginning of the 11th of December and it finished on Sunday the 3rd of March. Um, so we started with those, those ideas of, uh, of what is a moving image archive. Films that mean something to you as well and your community. Um, and uh, selecting films for audience, so that idea of curation, um, and uh, how does it make us feel? How do you want your audience to feel? And um, there was a task of like, an alien comes to Maryhill, what would you tell them about your family, about what you do, where to go, and things like that. Um, session two, we went into researching themes from week one that had come up from the conversation in that. And then week three, we went to um, the, the Moving Image Archive, and the guys there were amazing, Emily Monroe and Sheena McDonald. McDougall um, are, uh, they give tours and they already knew what kind of films we were talking about. And um, so we, uh, they, they were having conversations with the, with the young people and they were also giving their own feedback as curators as well, as professional curators too. Um, and then week, uh, session four um, was spent in the school, in the classroom, 
um, reviewing and refining the final drafts of the film. So I was, I, at the same time as all this was going on, I was going doing the research and rather than offering the thousands of films that are in the archive, we got an idea of what they were interested in and then I went to look for a short list, a long, long short list as it were, of films and then they uh, worked with that and then I edited it together and then they very much directed me like they needed that, they needed a lot more pillow um, hitting on the edge of a greasy mm -hmm. pole as well. Um, so things like, like that that was important to them and, and really thinking about what their audience, what, what engages them and what engages their audience and who their audience is going to be. Um, and then session five, we actually had a run through at the, at the Mary Hill Central Community Hall, which is where the Seymour Community Cinema is. Um, and that was a, a great thing to do because it put the kids in the space. It also allowed them to meet the other three groups. So the folks from John Paul Academy, from Hope Hill, <coughs> and from the Community Connectors group as well. And to watch their selections, uh, which was a really interesting process too. And then the final event, uh, which was a celebratory screening. Um, of the compilations, a family-friendly event, very much billed as that, everyone welcome. Um, and that's, that's the, the guys there on the, on the floor watching their own. I think that was Vest Man up on the screen, there's a bit of comedy going on. So, um, just in terms of the learnings from it all, um, time needed, as ever, we, we probably all, all know this, the amount of time that's required. Um, this was a pilot, so it was, it was great to sort of be able to experiment. Um, there was, um, as ever, there was a, a, a certain date when we got a funding decision and that very much um, decided when we would start the project um, in earnest with the schools and, and with the groups. You're working with Archive Film, and as most people who work with Archive Film know, it takes a while to um, get, make sure you've got the screening materials, got the licenses cleared for an event of this, of this sort. So the timescales that are involved in that had to be taken into consideration and it would have been great to have more time, but um, that's, uh, we, we, still, we still managed it, but again, it's, it's a bit of a learning. Um, interpretation was something that Becca McSheffrey from Glasgow Film really um, picked up on, which is just, it was really amazing working with Rebecca and with Jody um, and their expertise of, of, of adaptive sort of working in the classroom. So listening, completely listening to what the young people were saying and then uh, and turning that and knowing what the aims of the project were. And interpretation was very much a, a word that came out and, and it sounds a bit simplistic but it was certainly a word that I think the group in St Charles really learnt a lot more about. Um, I think they knew what it was but, but it, was, it was very much about well, it's your interpretation of the films um, and, um, and how we interpret them as we curate them for somebody else as well. And I learned a lot from them as a curator working with this particular group at St. Charles and also with the John Paul Academy guys too. For example, I do show, uh, uh, there's a film that they, they screened called uh, Tatty Hauken, which is a two minute um, advert for, um, from the 1950s, encouraging children to go and work in the fields and pick tatties. Potatoes um, in the, uh, is a kind of almost post-war effort type idea. and. Uh, and they're all going on their train off to, to the countryside for their holiday. Um, it's very much a propaganda film. Um, but on the train, and the, the kids at St. Charles had just done a project on World War II, and they were just saying, is that, is that like evacuees? And you're like, yeah, it's true. You didn't, I didn't make that connection. And they just, they just put another layer of meaning on the films. And that, again, that kind of interpretation. One minute, Sean. One minute, great, yeah. excellent. Uh, working inside and outside the classroom, um, so there's, uh, in the classroom there's a focus, as we all know, um, there's that kind of two-way interaction, You're, you've, you've got the attention, um, the films and edit was guided by research um, and vice versa as well, so my, I was very much guided by their research, their research was guided by my edit, um, and the work, giving the visit to the Moving Image Archive, very immersive, you're within the space that is a testament to film, and the screening space as well, being public, uh, being a familiar space to them as well, potentially too. Communication was key, Becca was the constant throughout the whole project, professional curators like myself working. Then the pupils had their brilliant teacher, Eileen Campbell, who I should uh, give a huge vote of thanks to. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it today. And then event innovation, um, the event was sold out. It's 191 folk there. Majority were folk from the G20 postcode, so from the local area. 32% were first-time uh, visitors to the Glasgow Film Festival um, and a lot of the comments that we had were around the, the experience and about the place and identity and then intergenerational working which is um, really fascinating to see what the potential could be from this project of working with the schools and with the, the older people's groups and the, the communication between their selections of films. So 
thanks to Jamie and to Mark for having me here. But uh, that's our Mary Hill. Say a bit more and hear a bit more about John Paul Academy's uh, involvement. I'm sure later on. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Um, quite a paired back minimalist presentation for you today. I have been not so well the last few days, I'm afraid to say, but um, very, very pleased to have made it here today. Um, thanks very much for inviting us, Jamie. Um, so my name is Yasmin Al-Hadithi. I'm a filmmaker and a film curator and a film education practitioner uh, based in Glasgow now, uh, once upon a time in Edinburgh. And this is Chrissy. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm um, Christy McCarroll. I'm a primary teacher at Glendale Primary School in Port Shields. Um, and I've been involved with the Understanding Cinema project for four sessions. I've done four projects over the years. With four years, years yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start off by just introducing the idea behind Understanding Cinema. Um, where it comes from, the sort of philosophy behind it and the approach. <coughs> and what I'd like to do with you all today is just run through the entire project with you as though you were a class that were receiving, uh, receiving the course yourselves. So um, you'll, see, you'll see how that goes in a minute. Um, so Understanding Cinema is actually the name that was given by the Centre for the Moving Image here in Scotland, based in Edinburgh. They run uh, film House and Edinburgh International Film Festival. Um, and the, the original name for the project was um, Cinema Cent Ans de Jeunesse, so 100 Years of Youth. Um, it originated from Paris, from the Cinémathèque Française there. And it was inspired by um, the teachings of Alain Bergala, um, so sort of film critic, screenwriter, and director. You may know him. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of his philosophy to begin with. So in the cinema hypothesis, teaching cinema in the classroom and beyond, uh, he promotes an understanding of film as an autonomous art form. So although he's looking at it being used in the classroom, he wants it to be given its own space rather than viewing it as a supplement to other uh, established school subjects. And for him, film is not something that uh, has to smoothly blend into school, but something that can serve as a productive rupture uh, for both institution and pupil. Now, I find it quite interesting that he approaches it this way, because although that's his philosophical background for using film in the class, in practice, it actually it, it does rupture in a way, but I think the word there is productive. Um, and it is, it is so productive, and it, it actually, it's both. It, it smoothly blends into the class, and I think that's something that Chrissy can talk about a little bit yeah. when we come to it. Yeah. Um, I think Glendale, there wasn't previously any film work at all. It'd be literally a film at the end of a term would be shown. So it was only when I was invited in to do the Understanding Cinema all those years ago that we actually had that first opportunity to do it and it's taken so maybe I would say this year for the school to actually bring it in, bring in the multimodal, bring in everything and that's it's been fantastic. It's it's a great opportunity for the children. Very much at like the John Paul Academy, our children in Pont Shields is a very multicultural area, but we are also very highly on the SIMD. Most of my class have got primary sevens this year, they have done the project. The majority of the class are on that SIMD one, um, so they've got the bilingual aspect as well as having to deal with deprivation issues. Um, so having the opportunity to do film and to learn different skills, to see different things and be involved in something, it really it adds so much to our curriculum. It's been, it has been fantastic. Yeah. So these are the sort of philosophical underpinnings of the project and the way that it actually manifests in reality is, as Chrissy said, we've been working with a P7 class this year. And I think you've had P7s for the, for the whole time you've yeah. run it? Um, P6, and the youngest I've ever had the first year that it was a primary 5-4 class. Okay. Well, so, that was, yeah. <laughs> so the way it goes is uh, we work with one class, um, normally starts as one session a week, and then you know it sort of builds up as time goes on, and, and it all gets a bit sort of 
hectic towards the end. Um, but we work consistently with the same group of learners for one whole academic year. And this really, really enables them to get sort of get their teeth fully immersed into it. Now, there are many different ways that you could approach working with the same year group, uh, educating them about film over the course of a year. You could dip into various sort of you know, different approaches. But what is beautiful about this project and has been really an absolute joy to work with as a filmmaker myself, because it's actually enriched my own practice, is that it focuses on one aspect of film language or a sort of thematic area for one whole year. So you look at the whole of filmmaking, film criticism, all through the prism of just one very small focused area. And it's really beautiful. Here, I, in my brain fog, when I wrote this, I wrote one take. I meant the long take. Um, I was confusing it with another one of my projects I've been working with. Um, so that was the first year that I actually worked on this project, because we were looking at the long take. That's my um, first year as well. Yeah. Your first year as well. Um, so, you know, watching film clips that all use the long take, different approaches to it, different reasons why you might choose to use that um, in film, the effect that it makes, the sort of, yeah, everything but through the one take. And then we had play and place and story as well for the following two years. Um, do you want to talk a bit about them just briefly? Yeah, yeah. The play one was a really interesting one. I had a primary six class that year and it just, it's a good subject. They could grasp it, they could understand it. It wasn't too conceptual. Um, the, the film that we ended up making um, had lots of links to, we watched the, the Red Balloon, it's one of their favourite films that we watched and we brought an aspect of that into the story that they finally created. Um, Place and Story was a little bit more difficult um, in its concepts, um, a little bit harder and it took a long time for Kate Burton who I was working with that year to just to get it kind of broken down to the children's level. Um, sometimes those of us who've done it, it can be a little bit too conceptual, it's a little bit too high thinking. And as a teacher um, with the film tutor, we have to kind of break it down to the children's level, especially when they're primary six and only 10 years old and they have no experience maybe of film, world cinema um, and older films. So Place and Story, it was, ended up a really fantastic big film, but yeah. it was hard, yeah. I think the the nice thing with this approach as well is that although it starts quite heavy in theory, so we, we meet up before the academic year, we have a training session, we go through a series of um, film clips that have been specially curated from Cinematheque Francaise um, that sort of you know explore that particular theme for the year. Um, we're given a lot of heavy philosophy um, and then we have to take it to a primary school classroom. But the beautiful thing is actually, as soon as you press play on those clips, you, we're at a level playing field with the kids because they are reading the film text that you're showing them. They are you know, assimilating it, responding to it, and we all begin to explore the theme together, actually, on a level. Um, this year's theme was the situation, which I actually found quite challenging myself, <laughs> even as a filmmaker. And um, I was approached with this. I'm going to read you now quite a, a chunk of text, um, just so that you go through the, the experience with us. What is a situation in a film? It's the relationship between the characters that is set up in each new scene. The film progresses from a scene to another, from a situation to another. Every film is made up of evolving situations. The characters that are taken in these successive situations evolve with them. They go from one state to another, going through these situations. They change, and even sometimes metamorphose or shift as part of some decisive moments. Yes, more text. The characters are not necessarily aware of their own evolutions or of these transformations they undergo when going from one situation to another. They don't control all of it because they go through the situations which are sometimes forced upon them, unknown or enigmatic. There are situations which, upon which they can take action and others only they, the, woof, when they can only react. 
Um, like in films where the characters explore or travel through unknown lands, I am not going to read the rest. <laughs> but you get the you get the idea. So we're we, you know we're given we're given all of this, and then we have to confront a P7 class, and we you know ask them, what what do you, what do you think we mean by situation in the film? But of course we don't really need to ask them. As I said, we just show them the clips, and I take it from there. Now, how do you break all of this down into, into bite-sized chunks that you can deliver across an academic year? Thankfully, they also equip us with the rules of the game. So yes, this is just a little bit of you know, showing, showing our young people in, in, in practice. So they, uh, there's the film watching that happens throughout. Uh, but then also from the very beginning, we equip them with their own set of iPads, throw the, threw them in the deep end, and got them to learn through making mistakes. And that's actually the beauty of having a whole academic year with one class that can repeatedly make their own short films and just make mistakes, and then watch them back, critique what they've done, critique each other as well. Things. Yeah. And they, they really got a chance to learn that language of what's working, what's not, you know, what's, what's the audience understanding from what they're seeing, you know. And, and this really developed, we saw them sort of absolutely fly away throughout the year. Yeah. Yeah. By the time we got to about January, February, they were starting to make the connections. So all the things that we'd built up from September, October, it just fell into place. They kind of like, ah, oh, oh, that's what you're talking about when we are seeing this in October, November. Yeah. Um, so building block number one, and this is a really, really beautiful exercise. We've, we've got about three minutes. You're joking. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, so oh no, I'm going to rattle through this then and show you some clips. Okay, great. Okay, so we started off with um, still images um, and got them to critique these and under, try to put themselves in the perspective of the characters. What's the situation um, that these characters find themselves in? So this is the building block one. What is situation? Um, we in, uh, looked at sort of status between characters, relationships, space, distance, perspective, and then with all of these, you can start thinking about f shot types as you go along. What it, what are the what are the shot types, and what would the next shot be in the story? Um, exercise two: film a situation between two characters without using dialogue, dialogue or a voiceover, in a maximum of four shots. This sequence must allow us to understand the situation that brings the two characters together. Should we show this one or should we go straight? We'll just show this one and then I'll just cut to the end. And
it's about there. Um, that was something they did only about two months in, actually, to the whole project. So just imagine, they went off on their own with a brief and came up with that. They edited it themselves. That was the first editing time. That was the first editing time that they had. Um, we then went on to an exercise that involved emotion, looked at jealousy, envy, shame, romantic encounters, and then um, our final film. Just one word on this very quickly. Uh, we were tasked with creating a film with the class, with the whole class, whereas the other exercises were all you know, small groups working together. This was a whole class project where they had to make a five to ten minute film in which um, the situation flips. So it's a relationship between two characters and at some point throughout the film something flips. You go from sympathising with one to sympathising with another. This was a, a very big project. We can talk to you a bit more about the process maybe in the Q&A. But the nice thing with this was that, you know, you have a, a set number of people in cast. You have, you know, a handful of directors and, and sound recordists and things. But it was a team effort that included, what, what else did we have? We had continuity. Um, that boy should go into that as a job. <laughs> it's quite specific for everybody. <laughs> it's like you did not want to get the wrong part of the outfit. Yeah. Um, we had the props people. Yeah, these people had, here working away. Um, we had our security, with some very feisty girls who would not let anybody within the head of the come yeah. through the, the corridors. So we didn't end up with that situation with yeah. Susanna coming into um, shot. We had the people who were doing just some of the backgrounds. And yeah. Basically, just involved. everybody was involved and got to work to their strengths, which is something that we only got a chance to understand where their strengths were with this. Um, throughout the year. That's it. Sorry, it was a bit chaotic. No, the service to say it's such a brilliant program, it's really hard to condense it. It's, it's but super. We, we can, maybe, we we can go it, into it a bit more, yeah. And the plans for next year as well, how it's going to evolve Ooh. from this, potentially. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. So, um, what we're going to talk about is uh, a small project, and I don't know if in any way it might be connected to situationism. But I'm sort of maybe preface my remarks by talking a little bit just about the concept of the control societies that we increasingly live in in higher education, where there's kind of there's, um, there's kind of clear limits or clear regulations about what one should be doing, and making a claim after that excellent discussion with the filmmakers there about making a claim for doing things where you don't know what you're doing, and this is very much a project which goes through. I don't know what Steve knew what he was doing, but I had no idea. Uh, so the, 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 the genesis of this is I'm at a little film festival in, uh, in Malta a few years ago, and I picked up a book by Siebald called Rings of Saturn. And Siebald's an interesting character because he was an academic who turns his back on uh, academic writing because he doesn't like the way that academia is regiment, going through a kind of regimented, regimentation and decides to put his ideas into and these kind of creative non-fiction or fiction, however one would describe his phenomenal and magisterial writing. And um, in the, when I read it, it left me with an absolute unquenchable thirst to find out more about the people who had walked in the ground in the place that I used to, that I was living in at the time, in Govan. And I returned, to, uh, I returned with this desire. I knew that something had happened in Govan a long time ago, but I didn't really know what it was, to my shame, I suppose. And I came back and I read a, a book by Stephen Driscoll, a, a collection of essays edited by Stephen Driscoll and the colleague Crystal Gleish. And I was totally blown away when I saw I encountered for the first time the kind of history of medieval Govan. Govan is a part of the city on the south of the river, famous for shipyards and you know making things, and now not so famous, not, not, not so famous for that governor as a part of Glasgow that doesn't have its problems to seek. And then, so I worked with uh, Encounter Steve, we had some discussions, worked with uh, a local production company, Martin Clark and Cara Connolly from Connolly Clark Films, and then we developed, this, had discussions about how we would tell this quite remarkable history in a way that would be accessible to the people primarily that lived in Govan. And we came up with the idea of, of using uh, are, are developing an idea where we would discuss that that uh, that history in the classroom. Um, so we'll just show a little clip 
from what then became a film called Govan Young. So we're just going to show the trailer for that and then we'll maybe talk a little bit about it. Okay. What are you What do you think you'd find if you dug a big hole in Govan? You know, like an archaeologist and found stuff in it. Do you think you'd find anything good? Uh, yeah. What do you think it was like here in the olden days? Old. Oh, no trees, no houses, and no telephones and that. Do you think you'd like to have lived back then? Why not? Because it was black and white. Is vacant strong? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, we don't eat people. Mine is not true Vikings. We're not true Vikings. We're true Scotsmen. Scotsmen. We are we pinch a Viking in us. Mm -hmm. I feel like they stayed. Then is there, could there be empty like that was kind of related to them still now? Yeah, absolutely. I have lots of ancestors. My mum says. And they might be Vikings, I don't know. So maybe you've got some Viking blood? Mm-hmm. My sister sure has some. Did you tell anyone at home all the stuff yeah. you learned? Oh yeah, my mum didn't believe me. I said that um, Governor is a place of kings. Where are we going? Back to London. I don't know what I've done last year, actually. I'm not sure what I've done last spear. I had a spear, and maybe the winds have got it. So, so what we did in that project is we went in on a Monday and we interviewed the kids and we asked them to have an understanding. We asked them what they thought <coughs> about the place that they lived, which they were quite negative about. Actually, I lived in Govan for 30 years. I was quite taken aback by how negative they were about the place that they lived in. We asked them what they thought about history, what they thought about archaeology. And then we brought Steve into the classroom and you can see we took them on a field, a, a field trip to get attacked by people called Galgay, which is a brilliant community organisation. Steve's in the classroom teaching them some of the history and then importantly taking them to the, the stones, taking them down to the river that most of them had never been anywhere near the river and then where they get to actually almost touch that person. So that kind of experiential learning experience I think was absolutely transformative. And then we, and so that was on the Wednesday and then the Friday we went back and we interviewed them about what they learned and it was quite a uh, I mean, you can watch the, the films available to watch free online. But the, the impact of that learning experience is absolutely transformative. And so for me, it's like as an encounter, as someone who lived in Govan, didn't know the history, the, the amount of stuff that I learned about what, how children understand where they are, how children understand history, and crucially how a sense of place can be absolutely... A sense of place can be absolutely transformative in how the kids understand who they were. So because we, at the beginning we asked them if government's important, and they're like, no, not at all. And then after they learn this history, and I don't think it's so much that it's a history about the government, about Vikings and the kings, it's just like it's their history, it's, a, it's something which is about where they live. Shit happened there and it was important. And so the kids then leave and they, 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 they kind of charge off at the, end, at the end saying, we're from Govan, we're from Govan. And it actually it's a, a, a small kind of cinematic evidence which substantiates perhaps some of the, the, the work that the geographer Dorian Massey has done on, on, on that sense that place, a strong set, a, an understanding of place absolutely impacts progressively on how people may understand their identity. So that's what the film squeezed in a, 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 a few minutes. It was brilliant to work. We got some money from the university, which was great, mainly because Steve had been digging up government for 30 years, 
when it wasn't very fashionable to dig up Govan. And now was it's... It, it fashionable now? Steve, well, I think <laughs> Steve's hit the jackpot and Govan's... Steve's work's been really important in changing the understandings of Govan and that was why the university gave me some money to illuminate Steve... Uh, illuminate Steve. Steve's been all over international film festivals. It was great for Steve. So that's... so, But that was good. I mean, it, it, there is still a space in the university, much as sometimes I might critique the university for this, that, the next thing. There's still a space in the university to unlock little pots of money which might allow you to get other little pots of money to make, to make films like this from the university's point of view. It's to showcase their, their uh, excellent researchers. But, but then the, uh, the work itself becomes something else. It becomes a piece of, it becomes a thing in its own right, which, uh, which creates new knowledge, I think, about other, uh, about other aspects of, of, of that particular place. So that's it in a nutshell. It was uh, brilliant working with Steve. Well, I mean, from my point of view as an archaeologist who'd been working there for not quite 30 years, oh, sorry, but, anyway, sorry. but anyway, but long enough. Um, and, I, you know, and so having, I guess one of the motivations of working in Govan for me has always been the idea of, of kind of making the community aware of the significance of this place they, they live in and trying to, in a way, provide a counter-narrative to the decline of the industrial era. So that was, the, you know, the big intention is to make people feel better about their place their, in the world and the place they happen to live as a way of uh, improving their, uh, their society. Now, so I've been doing this for a long time, but seeing it actually in a kind of film, I mean, I never thought of film um, in that sense, but it, obviously there's a kind of, the transformation that David was talking about comes about in part through this encounter with, you know, an authentic past. And it, as, I say, as David says, it doesn't have to be this amazing sculpture, which, you know, by chance is there. I think you could do this anywhere if you, if you use the same kind of ingredients. So I think the dramatic side of it was quite important. I think the, you know, the reenactors uh, add a huge amount of interest to the kids, and so suddenly it's, it's, it's jazzy, it's exciting, it's, it's unusual, it's not the normal day in school. But I think also, and this, the, probably the most time that they spent was actually being filmed. And so that kind of engagement and participation and being the subject of film undoubtedly created a sense of significance and importance. So, you know, the films don't have to be good. This one happens to be good and it's won lots of awards and everything. But I would have thought that you could do this anywhere and get similarly good results. Mm. So, you know, in a way, it's, I mean, we, we haven't proved that, you know, really we should you know, go and do it again and again and again to, to show that. But it does seem to me really uh, a powerful way to create this kind of new historical consciousness, which is, I think, what we've, we've managed to do for that one group. Maybe we'll just stop there because yeah. we, yeah. yeah, and we can, yeah, we can yeah. build that into a bigger conversation. Yeah. But thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> first, my first question: we, This is it's a, a kind of fabulous spectrum of film education with five to sixteen-year-olds that goes from the kind of pure art of cinema, with understanding cinema, and goes through every different kind of varietal, if you like, of film education supporting curriculum um, and developing historical consciousness, you know, wouldn't that be fantastic if we could have, all have a bit of that. Um, but my question is, put aside all of the extra stuff that children learned and engaged in, um, what, do they, what do they learn about film? Because this is about film education. What do they learn? So anybody can pick up on that. Is, are there examples or evidence that you said, actually, there's something specific about film that a child learned? And it can go in any order. I think for what we did in the project, I think I mentioned it there about that idea of <clears throat> what a, who's going to watch the films that you're selecting and that how does it make them feel, what's important to you, what's going to be important to them. And um, it's not something necessarily that the filmmakers will think about when they're creating something, but as a curator it's a different situation. And, uh, and I think that was certainly something that, that the, the guys in, in, in all four of the groups that we worked with 
Uh, think, about, think about your audience and your and how the what the kind of pleasures and what the kind of yeah, watching something. How do you feel yourself yeah. when you watch it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this was a, a question that came up because we did a, a little edited a dossier and. A, and when I sub submitted it, Jamie came back and like, yeah, but what did they learn about film? Because it's film <laughs> education, do you know? And as someone who teaches film, and it's like, you know, but I'm always trying to connect, make the connections between film and other things. Um, so for us, it wasn't a film education project. And I think I reiterate the point that Steve made. So that their experience on the day was catapulted or elevated by the, the, the presence of Steve in the material objects of the past and the presence of the cinematic apparatus. So you get three cameras in your classroom, you're getting mic'd up, you're going there, you're getting interviewed. What did they learn about that? I don't know. But I know that it elevated their sense of their yeah. importance and that there was a thing going on. There was one moment in the film where there's a young, a brilliant young boy who skips out the church at the end, no, it's not in the trailer, he skips out the, the church at the end, and he says, this has been the best day of my life. And before that, he speaks to camera all the time, and when he's speaking to camera, he's pushing <laughs> pushing other people out of the way, so that he can, so maybe he learned about uh, present, about how to be a television. So in terms, of, in terms of that Ofsted thing we had this morning, you know, that alteration of long-term memory, that's, you know, somebody's going to remember something for the rest of their lives. Yeah, uh -huh. you know, yeah. That, that's pretty powerful. Yes, and it's not done by being, read, being reading and being told something. Totally, it's, it's being done by put into a being put into a film. Yeah, and then we brought all the kids here for the cast and crew screening, yeah. and it was electric. You know, when they saw themselves on the screen, yeah. and it was just like woof. You know, the air I had to run up to ask Michael to turn up the sound because it was just <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, so they had an electrifying experience. What they learned about film, I think, is maybe a little bit uh, intangible. Mm, and I think that's a little bit about what yeah. we do uh, anyway, yeah. I try to carve yeah. out a space for the unquantifiable. And, and the thing that you can't, at the end of it, say this is exactly what we did. Now, obviously, we have to do that to get money for other projects. But so much of this is like, What's going to be the impact on those kids? I don't, don't know. know. Don't but know. Yeah, you, can't, you can't predict yeah, it. Yeah. Uh -huh. You can only ask afterwards yes, and then uh -huh. keep asking afterwards. Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think something that stood out for me from the learning this year was the growing awareness throughout the year of film as a time-based medium. They like to initially quite sort of rush into things. This happens, then this happens, then this happens. Okay, so what are your shots going to look like? Okay, it'll be this shot and then a close-up. And, then, and, then, and they just, it's all so fast-paced. Yeah. Straight away, impact, Straight away impact, 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 impact. When they watched it back, they realized they weren't feeling anything. <laughs> and then we sort of worked through, you know, why is that? You know, why are we feeling n nothing when we watch this? And why are we feeling something when we watch, you know, the clips that we were watching from world cinema? And we slowly began to sort of get them to work in the pace that was suitable for that scene or for that mm -hmm. scenario. Um, and that was something they really did take away from it. One of the so, films that we had, mm -hmm. um, we called it Flying Bobbles, and it was two girls sitting in our library on the cushions. One of them is bored at our skull, and it took us a while just to get her just to do that for an incredible length of time. It's about two minutes, yeah. and we're just like, just act bored. Do what, what would you do? Fidget around, and when they actually looked back at it, they realised, yeah, if she pings a hair bobble at somebody straight away, it's not got the same impact. She took her time so to yeah. she create in the viewer. She created, she created and then the feeling and then boom. And when she did that and the girl looked up and was like, What are you doing? And then back again and she fitted it from longer and it was a good four minutes, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. It's just Yeah, so they got to consider yeah. how the viewer feels, you yeah. know, when they're watching somebody walk on their own across a pitch, mm -hmm. you know, for that just sustain it for that whole time, you know, you're you're there with them with their thoughts mm -hmm. given. You know, mm -hmm. the understanding of what's just happened. So yeah, that was nice. that was nice. had some impact. Yeah, I think the thing that our pupils have learned about film is that it is for them. Mm -hmm. I think so often they think being from Glasgow in their social circumstance is a barrier. Mm -hmm. And I think showing them that they can over these are actually barriers, like film is totally accessible for you, regardless of your social circumstance, it is a viable option for you as a career. Mm -hmm. as well and just the partnership within the film just makes that so accessible they have all the contacts and they just 
show the pupils that you know what it is for you, and that's probably yeah. been the biggest yeah, eye opener for your pupils. One of my regrets about this whole process is the, kind of the awareness that it's only for a small group. Yeah. And like we've only mm -hmm. managed to grab that one class yeah. at yeah. Perry Park. And for one project. For one project. And, and I was hearing, you know, you've just one bit of Glendale, mm -hmm. one bit of Mary, you know, so quite mm -hmm. small groups. At, at mm -hmm. least in, in yours, it is, it's very inclusive. And yeah. it's, 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 well, at least from the slides, it looks like a lot of people are involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's quite a powerful thing because that, that's one of the things I haven't really imagined how we could go beyond that, you know, that intensive small group teaching. And that long termness of understanding yes, that's cinema. Quite powerful. That's quite powerful. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. one of the ways that you would make it available to every child is you get it in the curriculum. You know, yeah. Yeah, sure. Because if, you, if there's something you society thinks is really important, it slaps it in the curriculum because every child has to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case with film. But what I'm really impressed by is the ways in which variously you've, you've found ways of putting film into curriculum spaces mm. um, without necessarily worrying whether you're going to hit the, you know, the kind of the targets that yeah. we all imagine that we're supposed to, we're supposed mm. to hit. Um, let's, let's open it up and see whether somebody in the middle. So. Just a very quick question for Michael. Um, what exactly, uh, what format does the film club take? Because exactly. it's not just a screen. Yeah, so originally it was um, set up as just extracurricular for S1 pupils only. Um, so we would put a film on, it was after school on a Wednesday. That's how it started. And it just became more and more popular. And then second years wanted to do it. And then it just kind of grew arms and legs. And then we had to evolve it. We have to, had to keep thinking. We had quite a lot of success early on, which got the senior managers on board. Um, we were encouraged to pursue it and see just how far we could take it. So we adopted a kind of three-strand model, where in first to third year, they learn about the enjoyment of film and broadening their viewing of film, because it's quite narrow. It's like Fast and Furious, greatest film ever made. And it's like, well, there are other films. So it was trying to broaden that. There's seven Fast and Furious. Yeah, there's seven of them, so what we're talking about. Um, so it was trying to really broaden that in first to third year for just for the enjoyment to really promote the literacy and then we opened it out to senior phase and we're a school that normally the focus is on vocational subjects and skill building and we thought well film making is a skill so why not integrate that so that was actually timetable part of wider certification so they could actually learn it as part of the curriculum because it is skills based um, and that just seemed like a natural progression. They learn about film when they're young, then they learn the skills, and then it's all about the application in the real world when they move on to positive destinations. So the potential is limitless. It, mm -hmm. it just depends how you want to start. But we started off small, and then over six years, we've just kept, kept building on it. Mm -hmm. And with an understanding cinema as well, next year the plan is to work. So although at the moment it's a filmmaker working with one class teacher. Um, there's also going to be a sustained sort of program throughout the year to work with other teachers throughout the school to see how they can now then use film themselves mm -hmm. and embed that in their teaching throughout. Another question. I think it's getting more popular. It certainly is into film as an educational charity uh, who we run the film club with. They, they are now across Britain and they are getting more and more momentum within Scotland and we were very fortunate to win the award for out of 14,000 schools in Britain. So more and more high schools are taking advantage of it. Again, it's just understanding that it's not just about pushing play on a DVD for two hours after school. It's about making sure that there is the educational impact of film and it, it's not seen as just a reward 
um, to show that there is an educational impact. But certainly within our cluster in the north of Glasgow, there's the majority of schools are now in, embedding into film clubs, and it, it's free. And that's the thing I think when we try and pitch it to teachers, and it's time. Teachers are we don't have the time, but I think just with the encouragement and when they realise the support they've got from into film, that I think it, film education should be promoted in every school. I think literacy is changing, and we need to stop fighting it and start really embracing film. And, and maybe given that Interfilm has the infrastructure and the lottery money, quite a lot yep. of lottery money, that we should be looking at ways of incorporating the other kinds of film activity mm -hmm. so that it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of mainstreamed into a, a viable structure mm -hmm. rather than it's dependent on you know, individual projects. And so having yeah. the things kind of better coordinated and integrated yeah. is a, would be a good idea. I think there's also, um, I worked on a project earlier this year which was funded by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and that was working with Alistair Satchel, who works on understanding cinema and filmmakers, and that was bringing exhibition and filmmaking together in Alapool, Mull, and Barra. And I think that was funded by Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which is interesting that they're putting money into a project like this. It was for the Year of Young People last year, mind you, yeah, but it was. Yeah. Um, so, it not was actually an education there. sector funder, but yeah. it's, yeah, it's recognising a wider. Yeah, well, that's maybe a sense of place as well, yeah, but it's yeah. about as an enterprise yeah. element to that. I think you also, from my point of view, I've got a very supportive head teacher who I've had to prove basically that this yeah. is extremely worthwhile. So this year I've been able to bring in a multimodal education into the curriculum for the mm. entire from primary one up to primary seven. Wow. Um, but it's just, it's taken years for me going, we need to do this, um, we need um, to do this. You've had to be allowed to demonstrate yeah, and, to, okay. and to experiment with yes. this. because and it's, she's you know, given it's me not, quite a free read on it. Yeah. She's given me, you know... But you've been able to demonstrate what the, uh -huh. what the, the value the of quality it is. And, and, and the, as long as you can do that, then, you know, you're going to get support yeah. and, and, uh, and, and back it. Anybody else? One more question. Um, I come from an educational background, but in Latin America. So I was thinking, uh, we're talking about resources and like, Funding things, but um, in way less privileged places, <laughs> do you see these resources or this kind of you know, fitting to those educational practices? Like, could you see doing that in a different way? Where you, because you mentioned, let's say, ICAS, so I work in a place where ICAS wouldn't be possible. So, how do that down to a different level of, I don't want to use the word, but mark, marking out of the station? Yes, I think as, as long as you have the means to at least watch film content, I think, with your young people, then that in itself is, a, is an mm -hmm. amazing start. I mean, just getting them to learn the language of film and then, you know, even using exercises like the first exercise that you, we always have for understanding cinema that involves just still images, you know, learning to read those and, and setting up, you know, they can act out and create their own scenes and don't even necessarily have to do the filmmaking themselves all the way through. But the, the amount that they would learn just through watching mm -hmm. the film content would be enormous. And then also just, you know, acting out the scenes, creating their own stories, the sort of, you know, the other learning that they would get from that, or absolutely, yeah, using film for learning mm -hmm. across a curriculum, no matter what that would be, uh, without any equipment, um, I think is absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, um, we, I think we've just gone two minutes over time. Um, thank you very, very much for your questions and for your interest, but thank you most of all to our... Thank you.